Hello, everybody. My name is Josh. I also work at Claiborne Education. You've probably already seen um, the videos uh, that Clay did. Um, if not, go check those out. He gives you a good introduction of logic games. And again, as he's mentioned, and as I will mention as well, our methods may differ slightly in terms of outcome or um, in terms of the visual, but the logic behind it is very similar. And the process that we use here at Claiborne Education, again, I'm biased, but I think is excellent. And I'm gonna show you an example here. Um, so the test or the game I'll be using is from test 85. And it's the first logic game, questions one through six. Again, just like with Clay, I'm gonna go ahead and read the game out and the rules, and then um, I'll write them out and kind of go through the reasoning of the setup. And if there's enough interest, uh, maybe we'll produce another video here to go over the questions themselves. Okay, so first, the setup. We've got seven week period. Department store will hold weekly sales on seven types of products. We've got the products here, headphones, lamps, microwaves, printers, refrigerators, speakers, and televisions. Exactly one type of product will be on sale each week. The sale schedule will form to the following constraints, and then we have five rules listed after that. So before I go to the rules, let me go ahead and give you the, the setup here. Again, we have a sequencing game, and based on the rules, which we'll get to in a moment, uh, the game will be strict sequencing. Um, and again, the difference here is merely strict sequencing are rules, or include rules that put players on the board, versus loose sequencing are rules that only deal with players to, according to each other. So something like, P must become before T, um, or uh, T is before P, but after R. Those would be loose sequencing rules. Strict sequencing would be something like, and I'm getting ahead of myself here a bit, but the third rule, televisions must be on sale either the first or the seventh week. That would be a strict sequencing rule because T will either go in one or in seven. All right, let me finish writing this out here. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven spots. Uh, so spots horizontal, players vertically, H, L, M, P, R, S, and T. Again, well, maybe not again, but my reasoning here, I, um, and this follows on from what Clay taught me as well, but I always put the players vertically and the game itself horizontally. Um, again, just visually, if you put the players horizontally as well, subconsciously, you're just more likely to think H should come earlier. But here, there's no confusion because they're all in the same plane horizontally. Um, additionally, uh, shortening these players down to one letter, really important. This will happen with a couple other games that we go through too, but the goal here is to create symbols to put on the game board that will tell you the most amount of information um, without being confusing. So again, at the most basic level here, H for headphones. Now we don't have to worry anymore about the actual word headphones, it's just H. That's a simplified version, but that'll come into play later on with other games as well. All right, let's get into the rules now. So first off, we have a sort of a block, again, very loose block though here. It's not super helpful, but they tell us at least two weeks must separate H and S. Um, so you can write this out a couple of different ways. I usually go with when we have these rules that are atypical or aren't mentioned as much, um, I'm gonna actually just explicitly spell it out when I write the rules out. Um, so here again, this tells us that there's two spots in between H and S. But remember, there's two other key pieces of information here. One is that um, H and S, we don't know which one comes first. So it could be the fact that S comes before and there's two spots that separate that. So with that in mind, a nice little semicircle solves a lot of problems here symbolically. Just tells us that, again, H could come first or S could come first. Either way, there needs to be at least two spots in. And the at least part isn't written out explicitly here. This just means two spots. And again, because it's atypical, I'm going to go ahead and write out, um, literally write out at least two spots or at least something like that so I don't forget when I get to the, to the games later on. Next up, we have P and S must be on sale in consecutive weeks. Um, now, I'm gonna combine it here. Again, this is up to you guys what you wanna do. I usually find it's helpful to combine these rules whenever possible. Now I can see how it can get a little confusing because I'm also gonna put another semicircle here. 
that tells you S and P can be flipped. But we do know that they have to be on sale in consecutive weeks, and why not add it into one rule? All right, next up we have T is either one or seven. Again, um, just write it out something like this. Pretty straightforward there. And I should mention, forgot to mention this at the beginning, but it's always helpful to write the rules out first on the board um, so that again, you don't have to refer back to the actual um, the actual game here, uh, the the written version of it. If we can write it all out symbolically, it becomes a lot more manageable when we get to the actual game boards. Next up, we have a conditional, which goes along nicely with this previous rule, but it's basically that um, if T is not one, then R is one. Oh, let me write this out here. So we've got a conditional. In this case, um, sometimes it helps to go through the contrapositive here, but really the, all this is saying is that we combine it with the previous rule, T is one or it's seven. Well, if T is not one, it has to be seven. Um, hence, R is gonna have to go one. So either we have T one and then R can go anywhere, do whatever it wants, or T is seven and then R would have to be one in that case. That'll come in handy in a little bit. Next. The sale on lamps must be in the earlier week than H. Okay. So at this point, we can add it into this first rule again. The way I wrote it's a little confusing here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and write, um, yeah, L must be before H. I'm gonna go ahead and write it below here just because I don't wanna get too bogged down. Um, part of this is just because of the program I'm using. It's a little complicated to, to write all this out sometimes, but you could add this in. To the, to the one above, or you can just put it below here. Now, let's do a brief review here before I start writing out the game boards. We've got all five rules written out in the game board. Two of them were combined, hence why there's only technically four here. Um, the S and the P were combined with H, um, and L and H were combined. Um, you could combine it with the first one. That was the last rule here. I just put it below just for clarity's sake. And then we've got this T rule here, which comes in handy with R in a moment. Okay, in terms of tree diagram, again, the tree diagram is really helpful here because it, it helps lay out where can we go? How do we know what the best place uh, or the next best process or step should be? Well, first one is either ors are great to start at because if we start with an either or, in this case, you may have already guessed it, T1 or T7, if we start with this, well, we can just write out two different game boards, one with T1 and then one with T7. And we know that no matter how many other game boards might sprout off of that, in the end, they're only, um, we start with only two options. And it's best, it's always best to start with the one with the least amount of options possible. Because if we started with the LH one, think of how many options there are with seven spots where L must come before H. Now, sure, we could think about it in combination with this next part, but there's just so many options here that there's just not a lot um, in play. So I'm gonna go ahead and write this out here as T1 or T7. Again, this t tree diagram, just helpful kind of visual guide going along. Let's start with T1 first. Second game board down here. And again, what I'm doing here is what we call splitting the game board. Again, this is just writing out a, a separate scenario or a separate possibility for um, for this game. And we're gonna do this a couple times, um, but then once we're finished, we know that we have all the scenarios of the game boards in front of us. So first off, T1. Okay, so it is tempting to think ahead here and think, oh yeah, once we get T7, R is gonna have to go into one, so that's gonna be great. And we'll get to that in a moment. Um, but in the meantime, let's go back to T1 and think about, okay, now we have six spots left um, oh yeah, I should mention, we've got to take into account players that aren't mentioned in the rules, and I always circle those, again, you can call them floaters, as Clay does, um, but that's really helpful because it's very easy to forget about players that aren't mentioned. Let me see if I missed anything else. We got H, L, we got P, we got R, um, S, and T. Okay, so all the other ones are mentioned there. So T1, we now have a couple options to go. We've got three well, four rules total left to think through, but really three because we combined one of them. So let's think here with T1. Okay. We could 
try out this um, <laughs> this whole LHSP uh, uh, sort of conglomeration here. Now, that would be helpful um, for a couple of reasons. Again, we, you can think of it like this. If we push H across the game board here, um, we know that if H, well, let me put it to you this way. Again, you can't really respond because you're, you're watching me here, but we know, for instance, that H can't go second. Any idea why? Hopefully you realize that yes, L is gonna have to go before H. Hence, the earliest H can go is third. Well, from there, there's only so many other spots H could go. H could go third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Now that's a lot of game boards, uh, certainly one, two, three, four, five game boards. However, um, that's only five. We've got five scenarios, and then we already know ahead of time that the T7, and just kind of thinking ahead here, the T7 is going to also include R in it as one, and things are going to get a lot, uh, a lot somewhat trickier, I should say, once we get to there. So there'll be a lot more constraint in that regard. So let's start with H3, the earliest H can go. Okay, well, go ahead and fill in what else we know. We know that L has to go second. And then we know that the rule says at least two spots in between here, right? So S can either go six or seven. Now you have an option here again. You can, what we can, you can do what we call splitting the game board yet again. Could do it one more time if you wanted. Um, I'm just writing out these other options here for the game boards. You could do that. Again, at this point, because we already know that there's going to be five other game boards just for T1 with H, it may be helpful to, um, to just kind of hold off on that and just leave it as is for now and think through, do we know anything else for certain here? Well, for instance, what players do we have left? We have four players left. It's going to be SP, which have to be a block, and it's going to be R, and it's going to be M. Well, think about it like this. In terms of spots left, the fourth spot, what are the only players that can go in the fourth spot? Well, could it be P? Well, no, because S has to have at least two spots between, and P, the earliest P could come is fifth here. Well, and then we know S, it can't be S either. It really can only be M or R in this case. And whenever I can get one spot narrowed down to one to two players, it helps to write it out like, like such. So again, we don't have a lot left here besides that. We just know that S is either six or seven. And again, you could have P come after it or P come before it. Um, and in this case, because it's a timed game, um, why we call it the R of the tree diagram, it's, it's up to your discretion whether to split again. I would recommend against it at this point because we know that we have a lot left to go. So let's try the second one. Now again, we're pushing H across. Let me go ahead and just write what I have here. I have H3, and then I have H4. So one, two, so four here. We know that L has to go in two or three now. And what do we know? Well, we know that in this case, remember, at least two spots must become must come between S um, and H. So there's no room for S to go behind H. S can only now go into seventh. Well, if S goes into seventh, that locks into place. Think of it like dominoes. P now locks into place at six because it has to be um, on sale in consecutive weeks. And now we've just got, um, we've got spot five and we've got spot two and three left over. Now, going back to my reasoning from this fourth spot in the first game board, Think about it here for the fifth spot. What are the only players that can go in the fifth spot? Could all three of them go? Well, no, L can't go because it must go before H. Well, if that happens, then we've got M and R here for the fifth spot. And again, here, it's just a great way of showing visually that L can't go into fifth without having to write it out beside it. Here, by putting M slash R in the fifth spot, we know that L can't go there, and hence L is locked into two or three. Again, visually or symbolically, the point here is to represent the most possible on the game board without confusing. All right, now we're moving along. 
I'm going to kind of go through these other ones a little bit more quickly. Um, we've got H5, and then we'll have H6, and then eventually we'll have H7. Um, let me go ahead and write this out here. Give me one second. Cool. So let's start here first with H5, our handy S rule. What happened here, it's going to be just inverted now. There must be two spots in between H and S. Well, it can't come after, it has to go before in this case. What else has to happen? P, dominoes are falling like crazy now because L has to also go before H. And now we're at M slash R for six and seven. And I'll just put it something like that. That kind of helps take care of both. So next up, we've got um, H6. Well, now we're kind of in the, almost the exact inverse of this first spot. And this is what, what's helpful with this tree diagram. You, as you go along with the reasoning, it doesn't, there's not brand new reasoning each time, it's inverted reasoning. So what was true here is going to be somewhat true here. Again, there'll be a couple different options now, merely because L could go in a couple different spots. But S can now only go in two, uh, sorry, two or three. L must go here somewhere. Again, that there's a whole world of possibilities that you can think about there. Ignore all the possibilities and only focus on what you know for certain. So what I go back to here, what are the only spots or what are the only players that can go seventh? M and R. You'll notice there's a commonality in these uh, in this reasoning. And this is the great thing about the tree diagram. There's often very these patterns keep popping up and they become a lot easier and a lot more uh, you can do it a lot more quickly once you see these patterns and it helps you think through the logic of the game all the different scenarios so when you get to the questions you'll be able to, to get through the questions much more quickly with these handy guides up here okay so i know uh we've got tons of game boards here really it's just five at this point i'm going to write one more out once we get to t once we move t over because remember we still haven't used t um let me write this tree diagram out here we have or H5, H6, and an H7. Cool. H7, again, here we might have the most possibility just because, again, S can either go two, three, or four, and then H is here, and then P can go somewhere there too, and then L can go anywhere, and M and R can go anywhere. So there's a lot of open possibility, and this, this might have, on the Surface looked pretty frustrating because we've, we've already done five game boards. You've heard me listen, or you listen to me talk for a while now, and suddenly we have this game board that's completely wide open. Just remember, it's going to be tempting to try and split that up a couple times. Don't do that. Um, I invariably will leave this one blank with just as is with T and H, and it'll be interesting. Again, you can bear this out if you do the game on your own. When you get to the questions, just remember, there's only going to be, there might be one question where they ask about this particular game board. Maybe they say if H is seven, what has to be true? Who knows? Maybe, maybe again, though, when they say that, what if T is the answer? That's usually how it works out. They reward these sorts of inferences. And the biggest reward is knowing when to stop and leave certain game boards blank and just trust that they might not even ask you about it. If they do ask you about it, you probably already have what you need with the inferences. Something about this process tends to reward um, reward the user once you get to the questions. All right, so that was T1. Next we have T7. Things do change slightly. Remember now we've got to bring this conditional in which didn't apply beforehand. Um, so here we've got um, we've got T7, which is the second of our either or, like the tree diagram says, and then we know that if T is not one, R has to be one. Well that takes care of what was often, um, you know, one of our floaters from the previous games. Now R has to be one. Um, what we would do at this point is very similar with H and S and P. Um, I'm just gonna bring H across just like before because there can only be so many options. There's one, two, three, four, five options. Um, and you end up with 10 game boards, which is a lot. But again, just remember, you're only gonna be using a couple of them once you get to the games. and 
the inferences that you're making with these game boards are going to be rewarded once you get to the questions. Um, and I'm just going to write this out quickly just to show you how, because um, I've already given you much of the reasoning in the first five game boards, how the reasoning or how, how quickly you can go if you're just working through um, naturally in this case. The longest part for me is to write the, <laughs> the spots out here on the, uh, on the actual software. So obviously this won't happen to you on, on game day. How many do we have? Four. So one more for good luck. I need some Jeopardy music in the background. That'd be helpful. All right, let me go ahead and write, the, write out what we know here. So we've got T, 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 uh, R, 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 R. Okay, now we go back to our favorite H2, um, H3, H4, H5, and H6. Okay. Now I did something here, which you may have noticed already problematic, which I didn't do in the first time, but you'll notice, can H actually go two? Well, no, L has to go, L has to go before H. So there actually ends up being only nine game boards. So I'm gonna go ahead and cross this out. It's a fun thing to do here, to be able to cross that out. Next up, we've got L has to be two. And then we need at least two spots in between H and S. Well, that only means S can be sixth, which then means P has to be fifth, which then means M is the only spot left. Dominoes, everything's falling into place in this case. All right, next game board here. You guys spot any problems? Well, we need two spots for S. Uh-oh, that doesn't work. Wow, we're down to eight game boards. And this is a good example here of what usually happens. Is even though originally we had 10 game boards, which is, sounds like a lot, very often, I mean, majority of the time, a lot of them are going to be crossed out. Um, now, okay, so that one's crossed out, blah, 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 blah. Invert, remember inverted logical reasoning here. We've got S on the other side, um, which then means P has to go here, which then means L has to go before H, which then means M is the only spot left for six. Dominoes falling like crazy. All right, now we've got this last game board. Again, there's a lot, there's, there's more options here because we've got either S is two or S is three, um, which is fine. Um, however, at this point, I wouldn't add another game board. I'd probably just leave it blank because um, M and L could go anywhere too. There's just a lot going on here. You could, again, you could split the game board if you wanted to try one with S and two and S and three. That's fine. Um, I personally just leave it blank because I have eight game boards to go through. And if they ask me any the questions, then I can look at that particular game board. If they don't, well then I'm good to go and I didn't waste any time up front. Okay, so a couple of things of note before I end it here. One, um, there are other ways to do this particular game. The process that I'm showing you allows for different opportunities to uh, uh, approach this game. For instance, you could have tried S moving it across um, because it is a block here, and that does help somewhat moving it across. Um, and again, that might even have been a better way to do it. Helpful thing to note here is though that even if you make, maybe you get halfway through and you realize, oh, SP might have been a better thing to push across. Maybe I should have pushed S here, S here, and then moving it across. Well, even if that happens, um, you and you think, oh shoot, I should have done it the other way. This is just as equally valid and will provide just as much information as this one. Um, it's the key, the key is, is at the beginning here with the either or, with T1 or T7. You wanna start with something that is as little, um, little possibility or little uh, outcome as possible so that you, you don't get lost along the way. Because here we had five game boards. I didn't even write these out, but we have First we had five, but it ended up being three more game boards for T7. Okay, so um, uh, hopefully you enjoyed that. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Again, I'll be producing more videos and just showing you how I approach these games. It's slightly different than Clay, it'll be slightly different than you too, but the key is that using these tools, you'll be able to approach logic games on your, of your own accord um, and be able to use discretion, hence why we call it the art of the tree diagram. Thank you, have a good day.